Uh, joining us right now to talk about the global fallout from the pandemic uh, is Ian Bremmer, president of the Eurasia Group. So much to talk to you about, uh, Ian, in terms of what this is going to do to our globe and our relations with so many others. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about just domestically is the idea of, of, of the government effectively forcing companies to start using its powers or the, the government using its powers to force companies uh, to manufacture and make things that it historically had not. The, the administration uh, up until this week had effectively tried to avoid doing that, though they've now, it appears, based on some reports, they've used that, uh, that privilege hundreds of thousands of times uh, under this administration. So the question is um, how you think this changes the relationship between the government and the business community. Well, they've used it in small ways, hundreds of thousands of times, mostly to facilitate defense procurement, um, move things ahead in line, not telling companies to completely retool themselves to make ventilators instead of automotive. Um, I mean, let's keep in mind, I mean, given how strongly aligned uh, this cabinet has been with uh, the private sector, and also given how Trump has felt like he's had pretty good relations with key CEOs uh, in trying to help him together dig out of this crisis. I mean, the first big market move up uh, on the back of the crisis in the U.S. was when Trump uh, was, was in the Rose Garden with all the CEOs together. Um, you, you, there are a lot of reasons why he doesn't necessarily want to use force majeure um, against them individually. His perspective has been they're doing what they can anyway. Let's move in that direction. So I, I think unless you see um, real urgency and public uh, push against individual companies um, that that are to, to fill uh, to fill any of those holes, uh, you're not going to see uh, President Trump or the administration try to uh, roll this out uh, against company after company after company. More interesting will be industrial policy pushes that come for larger sectors being seen as strategically important, bringing uh, labor back to the United States when unemployment hits, say, 15 percent, as Goldman Sachs is now expecting by the middle of the year, uh, moving key supply chain back to the United States. I think those sorts of calls that you've seen from Peter Navarro, for example, in the last 48 hours, that, that's more likely where we're going. And do you think that's going to be a function of government pushing business or business deciding that it's actually better for business to be near its customers, given some of the supply chain issues and lessons that we may be learning uh, from this crisis? Oh, I think it's going to be both. Uh, on, on the one hand, there's no question that a just-in-time supply chain, uh, given the shock that we've seen, uh, needs to be more resilient. A just-in-case supply chain uh, is going to be more in the United States uh, and more regional, more in Mexico too. So companies are gonna be making those decisions themselves as they are looking uh, to pare back costs. Certainly some of that footprint would clearly come from China and from other emerging markets as they experience their own rolling shutdowns right. um, over the coming months and towards the end of the year. Uh, this is not just a one or two month question, obviously. But I, I do think that as we get closer to the election, and as the American uh, economy moves deeper into not just recession, but deeper into much more visible unemployment, there will be a separate push that will matter from this Trump administration. Country, companies will need to so be seen the, as being patriotic. Give, give us the geopolitical outlook, which is to say, do you think long term, as a result of this crisis and everything else that's going on around the world, that we are going to come more back together? Because I know you thought that that was possible probably only a year ago to maybe even splitting apart even more? Um, I mean, and my, what that my means for view, business. This is, yeah, this, this idea uh, of, a, of a G zero world where you're absent leadership um, it is moving towards deglobalization. Um, and obviously that's not efficient for global markets. We, we saw that last year already in the technology sector. I think that's now gonna be driving more deeply into both manufacturing and services uh, for some of the reasons we discussed. I think that because the thing that we're not dealing with yet is just how badly this is going to hit the non-China emerging markets. The Chinese economy comes back, but we have challenging relations with China. That's going to grow for lots of reasons. But emerging markets can't, most of them won't be able to social distance effectively in urban areas. The people who are too packed together. They have shared sanitation in many cases, all of that sort of thing. They aren't going to have the money to be able to rebuild themselves. They can't do the stimulus that we can in the U.S. or the advanced economies. As all of that happens, 
you're going to see herd immunity effectively occur across emerging markets. And that hit is going to devastate those economies in ways that you won't experience in the U.S. and in Europe. Clearly, that's going to make it much more challenging to get travel and business restarted with those parts right. of the world. That's going to drive more volatility and more fragmentation as well.